Hello and welcome to my review of the ZSA Moonlander keyboard. So if you've been following my other videos on this keyboard and also the Plank Easy keyboard by ZSA, you'll have an idea of where I'm coming from. So I've always thought the split keyboard format would really be the ergonomic kind of holy grail for keyboards, but never really justified buying one because I knew that I wouldn't really be able to use it portably with the iPad or on the go. But now I use the plank obviously when I'm on the go with the iPad and I can keep the Moonlander here on the desk for that sort of ultimate productivity machine. So one thing that really struck me since using this is actually just how much of an issue the split keyboard is in terms of finding your home row orientation when you're, you're switching between the mouse and that half of the keyboard. So what it turns out is I've actually been taking for granted the fact that when you use a fixed keyboard, you keep one hand on the keyboard while the other hand's on the mouse. And when it returns, that kind of positioning of your existing hand helps you find the home row with the other hand when it comes back. And when you can no longer do that because you've got a big gap in between the two halves, it's a bit of an issue. Uh, you know, you find yourself kind of misaligned. I've quite often started typing and I've been one, one column over uh, or up or down. Um, and obviously this is slightly harder for me because I've actually switched the key layout to workman. So it means I haven't got the, the home keys with the home bumps, uh, which are included if you use QWERTY. But obviously with the plank, I'm doing the same thing. So I've got the, I haven't got the home bumps on the, the plank either, but it is a lot easier just to bring my mouse hand back and find the right home row keys uh, on the plank than it is on this. So all of that's basically led me to explore using mouse mode on the Moonlander keyboard. And that is an interesting solution to the problem, but I'm gonna cover that in a bit more detail in another video. But all is definitely not lost, but it's definitely something I wanna make you aware of uh, if you're thinking about the split keyboard, because obviously ergonomically speaking, yes, it is brilliant. It's so nice feeling your shoulders in that more neutral position um, and you're not sort of rolling your shoulders around with your hands together. So it's definitely a nicer experience, but there is that little caveat, uh, which is definitely something you wanna weigh up in your mind. So I've come up with a, a layout that I'm pretty happy with now on this Moonlander, and I'm using all of the thumb cluster keys and all of the additional keys that, that aren't present on the plank uh, for sort of Mac specific things that I won't miss too much when I go back to the plank, but everything else has that commonality between the plank and the Moonlander. So before I bought the Plank Easy Keyboard, I actually realized that what I wanted out of a keyboard was only to move my fingers in a single keys direction. So all the keys I wanted to use, I knew that I only wanted to ever have to move one key away. I didn't want any jumping over a key to get to another one because I knew it was just too disruptive to finding and keeping that, that home row orientation, which I really felt was key to me feeling productive on the keyboard. And that's why I ended up buying the Plank because it is exactly that, you know, you've got your home row and then one set of keys that that's only one distance away from each of your home row fingers. And that is amazing. So working with that layout that I came up with for the plank, I've put that into the Moonlander for those same keys. Um, so that's definitely a good starting point. So obviously with the Moonlander, we've got the additional row across the top, which is the number row. And uh, I actually, so I don't wanna use those for numbers because I've created a, a numpad style layer uh, in the plank layout, which I've brought over to the Moonlander as well. So my numbers are on a layer that I access just by whacking down my thumb on the uh, sort of layer two button and then using a numpad right there under my right hand, and that is amazing. So with those number rows, I've actually switched them to application launchers. So I think that's a quite a cool approach because what I do, I find myself all the time doing command tab to switch between apps. So instead of having to do command tab and switch through to get to the app I want, I now just hit the, the launcher key. And I can do that, I can do that from memory most of the time, but it is that bit more disruptive, obviously, than from my primary idea of a single keys distance. But because they're launcher keys, it's, it's not so important. I think that kind of fits that role of that additional row. The way I've set them up is actually to use the macro system. So it first triggers Spotlight by sort of simulating command space. And then it types the first three letters of the application that I want that key to jump to and finishes by hitting return. So a single whack of that brings up a Spotlight Jet goes to that application and launches it. So I can kind of switch between apps and it's it's so fast, it issues that so fast that it's definitely fast enough as an app switcher, faster than finding the app in your uh, command tab interface on the Mac. And it's a similar kind of situation with the thumb cluster keys, which obviously I don't have on the plank. So I've set those up for some Mac specific shortcuts like print screen and enter full screen on the two big red thumb keys. So they're really handy actually. The, um, the, the print screen one I have set to the sort of one that goes into where you drag a box immediately. So you hit that, drag your box and it's copied that screenshot onto your clipboard. So one key press and you can drag and then you have a selection of your screen copied to your clipboard. That is really a game changer. You know, it's a horrible kind of uh, Mac keyboard shortcut shift command, Alt 4 or something, uh, just now one key done. So that's, that's really awesome. 
that's the kind of thing I think the thumb keys are really good for doing, you know, taking a complicated Mac keyboard shortcut and turning it into just one key. So looking at the Moonlander keyboard, you can see the keys are actually arranged in quite a unique way. So it's nothing like your normal old fashioned staggered keyboard. And it's actually not like the ortho linear grid that you get with the plank. Instead, you've got a sort of grid, but the columns are offset slightly to make it a bit easier to, to reach those keys. But the difference isn't so great from ortho linear that you can't switch quite happily between this and an ortho linear keyboard. I do that quite routinely. It takes, I don't know, five or 10 minutes just to kind of re acclimatize to it, but it's perfectly possible. And also like the plank, the keycaps are the DSA profile, which means they're all the same profile. They haven't got a different profile for each row. And of course the massive advantage of that is it means you can switch them all around and change your keyboard layout. And that's one of the most exciting things I've done in my kind of computer uh, career, I think is switching from QWERTY to Workman keyboard layout. Uh, I've been doing that like a couple of months now since I kind of got the plank in the first place. And I'm back up to sort of 70, high 70s word per minute now. Um, typing on that, it, it, it's just brilliant. It feels so much nicer than QWERTY and there are a whole range of other sort of more advanced keyboard layouts that you might want to try. Uh, it's probably not the sort of thing you want to do more than once or twice in your whole career but I'm happy that I've done it once. So it's only possible on this keyboard because of that DSA key profile which means you could switch a key from one row to another without upsetting the, the profile of the keys because they're all essentially flat. Actually, interestingly, the keycaps do switch between this one and the plank very happily. Uh, so what I did straight away was steal the back tick key from the Moonlander and put it on my plank uh, because that was the only key that I really was missing from the layout that I've got on the plank. But again, I'll go into these layouts in, in more detail in another video. So if you're new to this channel, please do subscribe to the channel, uh, like and share this video and also hit that bell button because YouTube can be pretty brutal in the way it filters out stuff. If you haven't clicked the bell button, you might not find the latest video. So please do that. So I make films on design, usability and workflow. Uh, so we're looking at products and sort of exploring the best way of making the most out of them and having as much fun with them as possible too. So obviously, as I mentioned in the first impressions video, a lot of the keys are actually printed with the number row across the top and some arrow keys and square brackets along the bottom. And I'm not using any of those. So it's a little bit annoying that I've got the printed keycap for a key that I'm not using. So I'll probably actually buy another set of the keycaps for this keyboard at some point, just so that I can replace all those with the blanks from the other spare set. So I'll have really what I want is the ultimate keyboard then. So of course the real distinguishing feature of the Moonlander is that it can tent up in the middle which just rotates your hands out a little bit when you're using it. And that's a really big deal, you know, you immediately you can feel that is so much more comfortable. And in fact I actually started using the Moonlander flat on the desk and that's it's pretty good because the thumb cluster being level with the rest of the keyboard brings the thumb key slightly nearer your hand. So there's definitely an advantage to be had by doing that but then of course your hands are rotated back down flat. And I was just starting to feel slightly uncomfortable in my wrist and that went away way as soon as I allowed it to tent up a little bit in the middle again. But of course to do that you have to put the thumb cluster down which put, puts the thumb key slightly further away from your hand. So essentially the thumb cluster can go from pointing down and that tents the keyboard up to actually pointing up which brings the keys extremely close to your hands. So if you've got smaller hands and you, you want to get those thumb cluster keys that's really close. I mean you just tap them you know they're right there. But of course in that mode the keyboard does have to be flat on the desk. You can't have it tilted up and tented up. Uh, but that's okay so you can experiment with that but essentially you can go from having the thumb keys extremely close to quite a little bit further away and the benefit of that if you can live with that is that you get the tent. So we're going to take a look at the software that that uh, complements this keyboard now and this is basically sort of the real the real brains behind the keyboard this is how you set it up the way you want so you can pretty much plug this in and use it straight out of the box there is a, a good default layout and um, it's got some advanced bits already in there uh, but you'll probably want to jump into the software and just rethink the whole thing and that's where this library comes in so you can start browsing the library of other layouts and this is really awesome so you can see what other people are doing and you can browse by tag and see all kinds of different layouts as a starting point and then of course jump in and customize your own so you can choose exactly what each key does so it's literally as simple as clicking the key and then choosing the function that you want for that key to do and then of course you can get really uh, into the nitty-gritty and create new layers where those keys will do something different after you've held down a modifier key to jump into that layer you can also change the way the layers are uh, entered either whether whether you hold down a key to get to it or whether you tap it and it switches permanently into that layer until you tap the key again or you know you can really go to town with setting this up how you want. 
And of course you can change the backlight color for each key in each layer. So that becomes a really nice way of just sort of reminding you what each layer is for, because you can see the backlight change as you switch between the layers. And then you've got things like the macro system where you can set up a, a sort of set of keys to be issued. And that's how I set up my application launches on the top row. And then there's a whole bunch of really advanced settings in here that you can jump into to adjust the sort of repeat delay and the timeouts and all this stuff that you know subtly adjusts the way the keyboard behaves for you so huge power in that software and it works really nicely you just load it up in a web browser set it all up download a little configuration file and then you can actually save that file to the keyboard using this app called wally -E, and that's how you sort of take all your settings and pop it onto the keyboard and then all those settings are on the keyboard itself you don't have to install any drivers on your device it you know it changes the way the keyboard behaves so you unplug it you plug it into any other device ipad mac pc all the stuff you've programmed on the keyboard will just work on on any destination device so that's important to remember because i think a lot of people think something like this requires a, a driver to be running on the on the system you use it and that's not the case it is all on the board itself Another new feature that I think they've just recently released into here is the walkthrough system. So when you create your layout, you can actually annotate it uh, with some sort of step-by-step -step instructions, which means other people browsing the library, when they find your layout, they can play through your walkthrough of it. So that's really nice. It's just encouraging this idea that we can have this community of people sharing these layouts because there's some really awesome ideas in these layouts. And it's really, it's really nice to be able to just browse through that and see what the person was thinking when they decided that the, whatever key should do whatever it does. So when you buy this from the ZSA website, you've got a couple of options to choose. So you can choose the black color scheme or the white one, and then you choose what kind of switches you want. And you can browse through their library and choose the different switches and based on the kind of characteristics that they describe. But of course, it's extremely difficult to know what switch you'll like. So I do recommend grabbing a, a switch tester off Amazon where you can kind of get a feel for them, but whether or not they'll you'll get one with all the different kinds of switches that ZSA offer with this keyboard, I don't know. So when I got mine, I actually got the Kales silver switches, um, which I much prefer to the, the brown tactile ones that I had on the plank. And uh, they, they sort of feel a bit old fashioned now and a bit, they're a bit heavy, kind of a bit more fatiguing on your fingers. And they, the kale silver ones are that much lighter and their actuation point is a lot closer to the top. So you can just do it, you know, without even triggering any noise at all. Um, you can, you can type away. It's quite handy if you're just on the phone, you just want to quickly do something without the person on the phone thinking that you're actually typing. You can get away with that with the kale silvers. So it's come up on a, on a couple of comments on the other videos that people uh, sort of seem to assume, I think, that because it's plastic, the build quality is uh, somehow lacking. Uh, I know metal keyboard cases are quite popular in the custom keyboard uh, community, but actually there's nothing flimsy about this. I, I suppose I can't really comment because I have never had a keyboard with a metal case, but it's definitely solid. You know, there's no... It. I mean, yeah, I can twist it. You know, if I really push on it, I can twist it. But you're not doing that, are you? You're typing on it and it's on the table. So I don't think that is an issue. Um, I don't imagine it's ever going to break. <laughs> and so I don't see that as an issue. It's, it's really nicely built. It's really nicely put together. You can see there's, there's like a million screws on the back. It's just solid, you know, it's really well put together. Um, I don't I don't foresee any issues with the build quality at all. In fact, the, the plastic finish is really nice. It's sort of slightly textured. Um, it just, yeah, it, it feels nice. It's a, it definitely has a, a nice look and a nice feel to it. What I'll just jump in to do now is quick sound test on what it sounds like to type on. So you'll hear a bit of the switch there, but you'll also kind of hear that resonance, I guess, from what the, what the sort of uh, impact of that sound on the board is. And I'll compare it with the plank and I'll add in for sort of reference my 2016 MacBook Pro keyboard, which is that um, butterfly design, the terrible one that gets jammed up all the time. Uh, half the keys don't work on that anymore. So yeah, uh, that'll be interesting to compare. So I hope I haven't missed out anything too important in this video. Let me know if I have, and I'll include it in another one or, or answer any questions in the comments below. And uh, thanks very much for sticking around for this long. If you've made it this far, that's great. And I'll see you in the next one.